Hello and welcome to The Reading Room, the podcast brought to you by your Rowan County Public Library. I'm Morgan. I'm Emery. And I'm Atlanta. And it is still June. Surprise. Hurrah. Surprise. The best month. Yes, my favorite month, except for my birthday month, because then I get presents. You want October's not bad. Actually. Presents in June. I'll, you know I mean, that's true. Actually, October's pretty good. October's my favorite month. And yes, I'll take I'll take gifts anytime. <laughs> we do. <laughs> the library is always accepting donations <laughs> for you listeners. Out and there. so are we. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess there are a lot of good months, but this is one of my favorites. <laughs> um, and it's not just because it is still Pride Month all month long, which is great and awesome, and I'm glad that we're able to celebrate that. But also because we have a brand new holiday to celebrate, and I mean it's not. The holiday is not new. Yeah, it's like the holiday is not new. But the it holiday is itself. newly nationally recognized. Exactly. It's a new federal holiday. We get to close this year. Yeah, <laughs> the banks will be closed. Will be closed. Will be closed. Uh, you know, the DMV will be closed. So Juneteenth, it's been around for a while, of course. They started celebrating this back in 1865. Its roots go way back. And what is Juneteenth? Raise your hand if you know. <laughs> so Juneteenth is the celebration of the emancipation of black Americans from slavery. That's why it's called Freedom Day sometimes. Like you'll see on our signs that we have out front saying we're going to be closed on the 20th. It's actually June the 19th is the recognized date. We will be closed on the 20th for this. Now, of course, you're probably hearing this like right before so hopefully you've seen that on our social media and on our other signs around town and so forth. But just a heads up, if you're listening on Saturday, we will be closed on Monday. And you can always check out our digital borrowing resources, especially Libby. Listen, I know that I should be pushing for everything that we use, but I can't Libby's in good conscience do that because Libby is the best. Libby, Libby is, is so, good. so good. It's good. Like also use Hoopla. And use Freeding and use Mango Languages and use EBSCO. Use whatever you need. Use Gale Legal Forms. We have all of yeah. these databases on yeah. our digital resources But like page, really but, use but Libby. <laughs> listen, we all know what you're here for. And I've seen the stat. I'm it's me. I'm the digital librarian. And I've that seen your stats. Means that That's you something. have curated a whole Juneteenth display on Libby, That's which true. you guys can go check yeah. out while we're closed for Juneteenth. That is true. I love checking out the digital digital displays too, because <laughs> I feel like there's always like five different ones it's not like hey by the way here is our cute little staff mm -hmm. pics like there is so much if you get tired of one display just hop on over to another one i try to cover at least a couple different things every month because it's harder for y'all to have to like find room even if you have time to pull books you only have so much real estate on which you can display them mm -hmm. and so that means that if you and Jess get together and it's like okay so May was Jewish American Heritage Month and it was also Mental Health Awareness Month and it was also National Get Caught Reading Month there's only so many shelves so like where do you stop but Libby is a digital space so i don't have to stop until i run out of time to you know as long as as long as i've got time to sit there and curate those collections i can do that so there is one for pride month there is one for juneteenth um i didn't do one for father's day hmm. because that's in june but maybe that's something we should do i didn't do one for mother's day either so it's a because quality. There was a blog post for yes. Mother's Day, so I almost wonder if we should do something. Maybe, Mother's yeah, Day. that's what I'm, because I try to, like, whatever y'all are prioritizing is what I try to do first, and then, like, I go looking for other stuff. Or the obvious thing, like, October's Halloween. Duh. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know. October's my wedding anniversary, Morgan. Why don't you care about me? Uh, it's Halloween. Well, because you made the bad decision to get married on Halloween. <laughs> I didn't get married on Halloween. No, um, I almost ha did. Halloween starts October 1st. Oh you know God. this. <laughs> I can't help that I'm you... I'm so sorry. That's like getting married in December. Like, everyone's going to pay attention to Christmas, not you. Your wedding is on Christmas. It doesn't matter if you got married on the 1st of December. There you go. Christmas. Your wedding's on Christmas. Historically, no one has ever been married in December. No one. That celebrates Christmas. I will go ahead and clarify. Ever? Historically. Ever. Check the books. Okay. Well, I think probably I... people who have not been recorded in, quote, unquote, the books... Um, have gotten married in December. No, because December's all about Christmas. You wow. heard what he said. Okay. 
Anyway. Yeah, a vanishing minority. How's that? <laughs> A Moving per- along, a, a percent of a percent. <laughs> June teeth. June so, teeth. Yeah, that's the month we're talking about you can't now. Can't get married in June either. It, you can't. You can't uh, because it's Unless. it's it's Pride Unless Month. Unless you're yeah. gay. You're exactly. Yes. <laughs> Queer people can get married in June. Pride yeah. Month, marriage month. Yes. So Juneteenth is something that we are thrilled to be able to celebrate the way that we are now because it's a holiday that we needed for a long time. It should have been recognized a long time ago. Uh, It is an important day. And part of the Juneteenth display is to educate people who maybe aren't familiar with it. Like if you've never heard the term, uh, for a lot of folks, it's new. Even though it has been around, um, especially if you aren't part of the black community, you may have not really been given a reason why you should celebrate it. It's not something that you perhaps have grown up hearing about. It's not something you have been told should be important. And it's not something that really is talked about, I know, in schools. Like, I never heard about Juneteenth until I was an adult. Absolutely. Many years later. Um, Now, of course, we studied the Emancipation Proclamation, and we studied what a great guy Abraham Lincoln was, and we studied the Civil War, uh, and we did study the, like, the freeing of uh, you know, black Americans from slavery, but mm-hmm. we didn't know and we're not really told that, hey, they made a holiday about it. And in retrospect, that seems kind of common sense because you'd think that's what's yeah. important to a lot of people. Absolutely. And then we learn about like VJ Day, but not Juneteenth. Like, right. I mean, the right. end or, of a war. We yeah. celebrate, so why wouldn't we have known? Mm-hmm. Not the end of a war on an entire group of exactly. human beings. Well, okay, I mean, just okay, a victory in the war against an entire group of human. Okay, well, there you go. Yes, an ongoing war, unfortunately, Absolutely. but that's but Slight that's amendment. that's part of. Uh, ha ha! Oh, I see what you did there. Ah, <laughs> an amendment. Oh, clever girl. But no, that's also part of Juneteenth. Is it is a celebration of uh, of that victory. It's a celebration of hope and progress. But it also is a day for us to reflect on where else we still need to go, on what work there still is yet to do. Which is why we still need to celebrate things, right? Like mm-hmm. that's the reason that there is a Pride Month. That's yeah. the reason that basically any holiday that is marked by a historical event Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is really put in place to make us think about why we still need to be celebrating it. Yeah, that's why we Yeah, that's why we memorialize things. That's why you have Memorial Day. Uh, that's why you have Labor Day. And a lot of people don't think about that now because it's been heavily commercialized. Pride Month has suffered from this too. Uh, we talked about this in the last episode of the podcast that it is partially about visibility and it's about like telling people who maybe for some reason, for whatever reason, don't feel comfortable or safe being out about being queer is that it also it gives them uh, the... And it it shows them that they're not alone. It shows people like, hey, it's not just you. There are other people here. But it also specifically is a memorial to all of the folks who have been lost along the way to, for example, the HIV and AIDS crisis or to hate crimes. And Juneteenth is kind of like that as well. Labor Day marks, you know, the uh, um, important moment in the labor revolution. Memorial Day is about soldiers who were lost in foreign wars. Juneteenth is not just about freedom and emancipation and the end of slavery. It is also about remembering all the people who didn't make it that far, the people who didn't get to see that day. It's about memorializing the people who right now don't really feel like they are fully emancipated. That, you know, it's reminding us that there is work to do, that there's a lot of steps yet to take. The work is not done. And so we have books about that. We have tried to curate a collection uh, that is hopeful and optimistic and that celebrates the good parts of that, that celebrates that progress. But also there are titles in that collection that you can check out uh, that where we have um, really made an attempt to highlight the voices of black authors so that they can say in their own words what we still have yet to do and what we need to keep doing in order to build a better America for the future, for everybody. And that's why it should be important to you regardless 
of your skin color and regardless of where you come from, regardless of your financial demographic or your age demographic or anything else. It's something we should all be celebrating because it was important to everybody. And it is something that we should all be thinking about and reflecting on because we all still have to participate in that work that there is left to do. So each of us has chosen a book from that display to talk about. And the, the, I wanted to really focus on striking that balance between hope and just the reality of the fact that like it's, it's not done, right? It's an ongoing work. And Emery, actually, you were the one who showed me this book. Uh, I don't. Atlanta know. showed it to me. Okay, so you found <laughs> it first. Okay, it's so it's book. so it's come all the way around. Um, and I, I cannot recommend it enough. It is, uh, it's an easy book. It's in our e section, which means that it's a very quick read. Mm -hmm. But what really got me was just, I think, it being an easy book, is a point in its favor because. I felt something when I read this book. I think we all oh, did. Oh, absolutely. And so the fact that it punched me in the gut the way that it did means that I'm hoping it will be very moving for a child who reads it as well because that use of simplicity, uh, simplistic text and just very forthright language, um, just simple statements really gets to you. And the book is The Undefeated written by Kwame Alexander and illustrated by Kadir Nelson. And it's such a great book because you open it up and the first thing that you see is every page is illustrated with like people who represent black milestones in history, people who push the envelope, pioneers who did something first, black heroes. And so Sojourner Truth is in here, Frederick Douglass is in here uh, but you also have like black soldiers who fought in the civil war a demographic that is often forgotten you have langston hughes who is a harlem poet uh who changed american literature forever um you have black sportsmen like muhammad ali you have people who changed the game for all of us and that's the part that I think when we start discussing people who made an impact on history, you have this distinction that we often don't talk about. It's kind of an unconscious uncon conversation point in that maybe it doesn't even come up in the conversation. It defines the conversation by its absence in that black Americans contributions are discussed differently. And that is, they're always talked about, in my experience, in relation to how important they are for black Americans mm -hmm. and not for all of us. So like when you talk about Martin Luther King Jr., for example, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., um, we all celebrate MLK in different ways. And he's got a holiday just like Juneteenth. It's just as important. Um, but when you talk about MLK... What do we talk about? We talk about the difference that he made for black lives. We talk about the representation that he represents for black Americans. And sometimes uh, he is held up as this unattainable standard that black folks are supposed to uh, like subscribe to. Like, why can't you be more like Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. right? Like, we, we have lionized him and we have memorialized him in this unrealistic way where we sweep his, uh, you know, his justifiable and completely valid anger and discontentment under the rug. And all we talk about is his nonviolent protests. All we talk about is that one big speech where he had a dream. Um, and instead, we should be talking about how he changed all of America for the better. And that's what this book does. You know, as I as I flip through this, I see Ella Fitzgerald. Uh, you know, I see all of these faces that I recognize. Uh, like, is that? I'm not sure if that's Henrietta Lacks in that photo. I think it might be. I think that's Henrietta Lacks, but I'm not sure. Uh, and so, and I think that that's Ruby Bridges. Yes, that's definitely Ruby. I think that's Ruby Bridges. Something beautiful about it, though, is that. Some of them we don't recognize, you know, like yeah. maybe that could even be on purpose. Like some of them are actual figure stones, mm -hmm. figureheads. 
And then some are just people because this book is about the people, not even about. And there's something so powerful about this book because, I mean, since it is an easy book, it's written very attainably. You can achieve Mm -hmm. this book in a short period of time. But the author knows where they wanted, where he wanted to put his impact. You know, like the words get bigger or there's Mm -hmm. more space in between the letters. And like you feel the way that it should be spoken in a way that is just unmatched in a lot of other books. Absolutely. The formatting is one of the most important things here, I think, for me, where it feels like you're having a conversation with the author. Yeah. And, you know, the way that this is, it only takes a couple pages to get me. Like, I'm already, I can feel the corners of my eyes burning. Mm -hmm. I wish we could Um, read it right now. Because. (laughs) Yeah, me too. You're only two pages in and there's a picture of a, a black uh, early 20th century family. I think it could be late Victorian, late 1800s, could be early 1900s. And it says the ones who survived America by any means necessary. And then you flip the page and it says, and the ones who didn't. And there is no illustration. It's no. just two and blank it is white pages. the only page, well, I guess set of pages in the book that doesn't have an illustration. Yeah. Which is yeah. so powerful. And it just, that hits me right right in the, the center of the chest every time that I read it. So it is such a powerful book and the illustrations are so good and so wonderful. It was in the running for the Caldecott Award last year and it got beaten by Watercrest, which is also a wonderful mm. book. But this, I think, I, I read it because I thought it was going to win and then I was like, oh my god, everybody read this book now. It yes. will change your life. So I definitely recommend that you check this out. It is a great book for a child, but you by no means have to be a child. You do not have to be like nine and under to enjoy this book, to get something from this book, to be impacted Mm -hmm. by this book. Certainly not. Uh, I think that the illustrations that they chose, I think that the words that they chose and the the events that they chose to portray and the words that they talk about them with are very important. And just flipping through it, uh, you know, it really makes me feel something every time. So I hope that it will make you feel something as well. And it's, we all have our favorite books. And then you also have books that touch you, that do something to you. And those aren't always necessarily the same books, Mm -hmm. right? Like you can read something like The Lord of the Rings and you can be really inspired by that and it can be a great story and it can make you more interested in in fantasy, but maybe it doesn't cause you to grow up and become an author yourself, right? Maybe you just really like that book. Maybe you just remember and it sticks with you and the same for any other book. And then there are books like this one where... If I close my eyes, I can see this whole book in my head without taking it off the shelf because it it just really, it leaves something mm-hmm. when you read it. And so it is my hope that if you take this book and read it yourself, uh, or if a child reads this, that it will impact them the same way. And this to me is like Juneteenth kind of distilled down. This mm-hmm. is all of the great things that have happened, all of the, the the obstacles that have been hurdled by black Americans to get where they are today, all the people who broke down barriers and kicked in doors. But also it is a memorial to the folks who didn't get to make those contributions or whose contributions were dismissed, were you know swept under the rug, uh, were you know, taken over by somebody else or someone else got the credit. And this is a reminder of all of that in in one space. And it's really hard hitting, but it also is very optimistic. It's a very hopeful, very positive book uh, because it just speaks the truth. And the truth is great things have happened, but there's still a long way to go. So I'd say definitely, you know, if you have a kid, read this to them, but you don't have to have a kid to read this book and get something from it. Because, I have a copy of this book. Like yeah, you absolutely is... don't have to be a child or have a child to be fundamentally impacted by it. Yeah. Yeah, I think so, you're right. It really becomes part of you. Like once you've read it, you've you've kind of gotten what you needed to, but mm-hmm. read it over and over again. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Check it out as many times as you want. <laughs> and I hope that we see a lot of circulation on the whole Juneteenth collection uh, because they're all important books. And it is something that's it's a history we need to discuss. And it's a history, too, that uh, is complicated and very long. 
And so I think that it's great that we have these uh, you know, very skilled, very determined black scholars who have gone in to tell that story, to unravel that skein and give us this information in a way that we can digest it, whether that is in the form of a children's book or whether that is in the form of basically a biopic of the holiday and the celebration itself. So, yeah, check this out if you've got a little kid or if you don't. <laughs> take home The Undefeated by Kwame Alexander and Kadir Nelson and uh, and give it a read. And I have to really thank bo- both of you for introducing me to this book, um, especially since you were the one who found it first. <laughs> so your book recommendations are always so good. So, <laughs> thank you. So what, what did you choose from the display? I also chose a juvenile book. An easy book, in my opinion, but we don't have any easy biographies, so it goes directly into the juvenile biography. Um, And it is a story of Harriet Tubman, but when she was young. So it's called Minty, a story of young Harriet Tubman, written by Alan Schroeder and illustrated by Jerry Pinckney. And I love this book. I thought of it immediately when we started talking about Juneteenth. Because it's it's different from just Black Lives Matter, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, I've, I've got a lot of books that I can talk about about the Black community. But Juneteenth is specifically about the freedom and the finding of that freedom. So I'm like, okay, Underground Railroad. Harriet Tubman is one of the first people that comes to mind when I'm thinking of the actual freedom journey. Um, and Minty is a story, it's a fictionalization of kind of how she got to where she was. So whenever she's young, she's a slave in the house, and then she makes a spill or something happens and she gets sent out to the fields. And in the fields, she makes a couple of friends. She learns her way around how to behave in a way that they want her to. Um, But Minty's not like that. Um, So she keeps telling her parents over and over that she's gonna run and they're like, well, you know, you'll probably be killed if you do that, so I would rather you didn't. And then one day her dad decides, like, well, she's going to run anyway. I need to teach her a few things. And so it's kind of just a nice little biography, really, but it's it's a glimpse into Harriet Tubman's life when she's just, like, 12 or 13 years old, just a little girl, but she has been, she's been beaten and she's been pushed around and She's, she's ready to go. Enough. Yeah, <laughs> she's ready to go, and they they don't know if she can make it. Mm-hmm. And obviously, it worked. You know, like we we know the history now. We know how far Harriet Tubman came and how many people she did help. But in in this book, we don't necessarily get to see her make her journey. And I think that that is also really powerful. Yeah. Like it, it kind of ends like I hope she'll be okay. It's almost like the journey to the journey we know about. Exactly. Yeah, that first leg. I think that that's awesome because, yeah, when we study Harriet Tubman, we are always focusing, I think, on her part that she played in the Underground Railroad and in helping slaves to escape to the North during that a specific time period. But I don't remember being told a lot about who she was as a person. Right. You heard about her as a hero, again, like MLK, right? I didn't read a lot of his letters and writings until I was an adult because the picture that I got of him as a kid was when he was already a hero. And so you got to hear about him after the fact. And Harriet Tubman was the same way where she had things to say. She had opinions. There was a reason that she did this. There was a path she took to get where she got to the point Mm -hmm. that we hear about. But what you hear about is the deeds that were done after she reached that point. You don't really get the formative background story, the origin story of the superhero. Yeah. I find it really special because I mean, I... You want to save her. And I think that that's something beautiful about, I mean, we we both chose juvenile books. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is like this almost innocence for the idea. These are these are written for a certain audience. So there is an innocence to a very non-innocent topic. Mm -hmm. Like it is something that is so hard to talk about. But we get to present the story in a way that can be talked about Mm -hmm. and that that way that I want to save this girl you know like so does everybody else that reads this book they're like well why is this happening why can't she just go home Mm -hmm. and I think that that's that's a really powerful outlook that we are strong enough to have now Mm -hmm. and hopefully it will always be that way you know but like 
until we start, like you said, it's powerful that we celebrate. And I think like talking about stuff like this, that's why we need to celebrate. Yeah. yeah, I think like, you know, like Morgan was saying, like, we do always look at her kind of as the, the hero of the story already. Like we're introduced to media about her, surrounding her from a place of this is who Harriet Tubman was as an adult. These are mm-hmm. all of the things that she accomplished for other people. Mm-hmm. And so it is a really interesting, insightful look into her origin story. You know, it's almost like when you are reading anything that has a very clear hero, you want to know, like, what happened? Like, how did they get there? What made it their life's purpose to do this thing, to save these people? And having a look into that is really special. Especially because something you said right there really resonates with me that a lot of the, I think the delivery of some of these people almost makes them feel like characters, Mm -hmm. the way we are taught about them and hear about them. And it's difficult, especially when you have someone who is lionized, who is bigger than life, you know, like MLK, like Harriet Tubman, they have done these, these massive things. They have broken new ground or they have broken down barriers or whatever. And it's delivered like a story, like you're talking about a superhero who did these things. And it's easy to forget, especially as a child, that these were real people because you didn't live through it. And that's one of the things that makes history so important and accurate history so important. The firsthand accounts, reading what they did in their own words, because you weren't there. You know, this, this happened 200 years ago, right? We were not there. And so reading about that in their own words is so important, but also like you in, in any format, you have to remember these were real people and they did have a background. They did have an origin story, but not because they were characters because they were real and you have to read it in that context and not every story delivers it that way. And I think like this one seems to do that Mm -hmm. in a way where like, no, listen, she was a real girl. She had a childhood And when you think about Harriet Tubman, you think of this iron hard woman who cannot be stopped, who is full of anger and power and and this this massive energy uh, to just she's going to go in and you just that's it. Whatever she does, whatever she sets her mind to, Harriet Tubman is going to accomplish. And we know that because we see the results because she got results. (laughs) Mm -hmm. She she got results and she did not take no for an answer, uh, you know, when it came to this mission that she was on to help her fellow black Americans out of slavery. And so to see the vulnerability, to see her as a child with questions, to see her have to grapple with and come to understand why she's in this situation and then reject it and be like, but why though? But why though? But why? Well, that's a stupid reason. That's a bad reason. Why do we have to accept this? And the answer is you don't. And to see her grapple with that, I think that makes it more accessible to the children right. reading the books. Mm-hmm. It does make her more real because yeah. she was a kid. <laughs> yeah, because now you as a kid are reading about her as a kid, and it's like, well, these are the questions I'd have. Oh, you yeah. know, This is what I would have done. This is what I would have done. Well, I would have run away from home, too. Well, you know, dang, man, she really had it hard. <laughs> uh, so I think that that's great because yeah. I think one of the things that stops a lot of folks Uh, from having the conversations upon which Juneteenth is based is that it's an uncomfortable conversation and it's compounded by the fact that not all of us have all of the information because it's something we're just not taught deeply and we are not uh, we're not led to that information it's not handed to us freely you have to go out and get it for yourself and sometimes you don't think about it sometimes you don't know to ask the question Uh, sometimes you just don't have time you're too busy to learn things and that's awful And so I think that these books are really important because they offer us a way to have that conversation. You read this book to a child or let a child check this book out and they're going to have questions. And it's a gateway to be like, well, you know, that is a good question. Let's find out together or let's talk about this Mm -hmm. because people are afraid that children are too fragile to discuss difficult topics. And it's like, no, no, quite the opposite. Children are resilient. Mm -hmm. Children have enormous imaginations and these huge open minds that haven't condensed yet to follow a single like neural pathway. They're not like adults where we we literally get biologically set in our ways. 
children are malleable, and what you teach them early on matters. So you teach them about consent, you teach them about cooperation, you teach them about love and friendship, and you teach them about this with books like these. You sit them down and you say, no, it's okay to have these questions, yeah. and these were bad things, and that's why we don't do them now, and it's important you don't treat people like this, and it's important that we keep moving forward from here. These books are a way to start that conversation. Somebody said something to me really that I found really beautiful the other day about those uncomfortable conversations. Um, and he was like, I mean, yeah, it kind of made me uncomfortable to read about it and to think about it. But, you know, I bet it was pretty uncomfortable to live it, too. And that was this was a Ooh. pride conversation, not a Juneteenth conversation. But it just struck me to my core to hear mm-hmm. somebody that really thought about it from that perspective that I didn't expect to think about it from that perspective. And I think that we should all take a, take a page out of that book, you know, like it is uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Embrace that because there are a lot of people that have suffered a lot of uncomfortableness Mm -hmm. and you're just going to avoid the conversation. Yeah, there you go. So if it makes you a little uncomfortable to think about it, there, there you go. In. Yeah, like <laughs> I hope it does. Yeah, like that's that's constructive because that gives you a sense of like, okay, that's why the conversation is happening, mm-hmm. and it doesn't matter what kind of oppression or negativity you're talking about. If you're talking about being poor and like poverty, if you're talking about starvation, if you're talking about war, anything like that, it's uncomfortable because it's uncomfortable. And that's why you should talk about it, because if something makes us uncomfortable and we clam up and we don't talk and we don't write about it, we don't read about it, we don't make shows about it, we don't put it in the theater, then the conversation doesn't happen and the uncomfortable thing just goes unchecked. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's important once in a while you should, I think, have a social and like almost moral responsibility Mm -hmm. to occasionally engage some media that makes you a little uncomfortable because that is you growing. Think about when you're a teenager and you are getting taller and you're getting bigger, right? You have growing pains. Your bones and your muscles and everything in you, sometimes you just, it hurts because you are growing up. And that never stops. So even as an adult, if you read something or you watch a movie or whatever, you have a conversation with somebody and it hurts a little bit, maybe that just means that you're growing. And that's okay to do. And it's something that you don't have to do alone. And it's something that it's okay to to have questions about that growth as well, uh, which is what we're here for, to encourage that, but also to provide the resources for it. So if you are a full-grown adult and you don't want a children's book and you would like to really delve into this and and have the uncomfortable (laughs) conversation, let me recommend um, On Juneteenth by Annette Gordon-Reed. She wanted to talk about doing the work. This is a full-blown biography of the holiday, and uh, we have both the ebook and the audiobook on the Libby display ready to check out. So there is a, a really good deep dive into what Juneteenth is, what it means, where it comes from, that kind of thing. Uh, and it's a great grown-up gateway. Uh, it, it's a bit of an academic book, but it's a great grown-up gateway to the uncomfortable conversation as well. And I think it's less... I said it's academic. I don't want that to put you off. Um, because sometimes I know I, when someone describes a book as academic, it's like, oh, mm. you could pour water directly on this book and it would just suck it up. It is so dry. <laughs> and <laughs> Annette Gordon Reed is is not her book is not like that. Um, it is a scholarly book, but it is not written like a textbook. It is it, you, it's engageable. It's just well researched. Yeah, it is. So, <laughs> what about you? Well, related. Um, I did not choose a children's book. And also, this book is not on our Juneteenth display. It's actually on our Pride display. This book is called Not Straight, Not White, and it is by Kevin Mumford. Um, And it is essentially just a history of black gay men in America from the 1950s through the 1990s, which means that it covers a really wide array of topics because there were a whole lot of big historical events that went down um, both explicitly for black Americans and for gay Americans in that time frame. And so I think it's really important that there is a piece of media that kind of covers the basis of what it was like to be both of those things at the same time during some really, really hard stuff, really hard historical events. So I think it, it kind of starts 
you know, around the time of the March on Washington and like really huge civil rights movements and then ends around the AIDS epidemic. And just a lot of it is focused on how much more difficult it was to be not only gay or not only black during those times, but both, which is clearly why it's an important read yeah. because it is a book that should be and is a topic of so much conversation and reflection. Mm -hmm. I definitely want to read that because I mean, I mean, I admit it's probably due to my white privilege, but I had never considered being both during mm -hmm. that time period. You know, like, of course, I know people that are both in real life right now times, but like thinking about but the 50s what, through the 90s, yeah, mm -hmm. what people were going through, what Americans were going through yeah, and being both black and gay. Because you get to see a lot of the ebb and flow of how at different times in our history, being LGBT plus has been more and less acceptable. And that also is different across communities. You know, mm -hmm. like it's it's more acceptable uh, among a lot of women than it is for men. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's more acceptable if you're white than it yeah. is if you are black or Latino. And there are all kinds of reasons for that. And I mean, I had this conversation with someone the other day. We were discussing not this book, uh, but this this topic about the compounded obstacles and challenges that you have to face if you fall into more than one group. So like if you're white, you have a lot of privilege because you are the majority power holder in the structure. But if you are poor, then like it takes a lot of that power away. So there are still challenges like you'll never have challenges that you have to overcome because you're white in the way that a black American has to overcome things just because they're black. But you have these shared challenges where if you are white and poor or black and poor or Asian and poor or native and poor, then there are things that because you are poor that you cannot do. There are doors that are just not open to you. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, if, if you are if you are LGBT, um, if you are a woman, uh, you know, specific stuff like stacks on top of each other and makes it harder. And I think that's an interesting look into that because. Now, of course, I'm not a scholar of this, so like take what I say with a grain of salt. And definitely if a black American scholar says something to you about it, like listen to them first. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, when you look in from the outside, what's the stereotype, especially of inner city or quote unquote urban black society, right, is there's a lot of toxic masculinity, a lot of machismo. You have to be the toughest guy, right? Mm -hmm. And they have very clear ideas about what it means to be a man, which means mm -hmm. responsibility for your community and protecting your family and stuff. And that's because they have had a boot on their neck for so long. Absolutely. Right? You have to be tough to survive. It's even in this children's book over here. It's like the people who survived by any means necessary. You do what you have to do. And so one of the outgrowths of that, one of the negative consequences, is that because wholly separate from that, there has been a, a movement or in the, the social zeitgeist, whatever you want to call it, being a gay man is often associated with being feminine. And Absolutely. being feminine is completely separate from that, associated with often being weak. Mm -hmm. And all of these are incorrect perceptions because there are super macho gay men and most women are stronger than the average guy that I know physically maybe you know is like that's the, the individual person but emotionally and mentally for sure oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she can handle it because she's been oppressed in a way that i have not been for being a guy right so it, it all stacks up we think women are weaker than men and then you apply that stereotype to gay men and be like oh well you're like a woman then so that means that it's hard to be a gay black man because they can't be weak and if you are gay you're weak and feminine Right. Absolutely. So that's really difficult in, in contemporary society. It's hard to do that because then you get rejected by your own community. Like, mm -hmm. oh, this is a terrible thing that you're choosing to be. Right. And that was hard even for people who were around back during the civil rights movement. One of my personal heroes uh, as an adult has come to be Bayard Rustin. And Bayard Rustin uh, was one of the power players behind the civil rights movement. He was there with Martin Luther King for a lot of what happened, and he marched with him. But he was gay. And what that means is that he often faced pushback from his own community. And there were a lot of uh, straight 
um, you know, especially conservative or religious black folks who they didn't want someone like him as a figurehead. So he became kind of like a an influencer from behind whoever was doing the talking. He was never at the podium. He was always to one side and behind the guy giving the speech. Uh, but he was a really influential activist. And he worked with a lot of really influential people all the way up until his death. And, and he changed America for the better. But he wasn't able to be that and also be an out black gay man for a lot of his activist career because people just would not give him the time of day or would not give him as much credit for the things he was doing and for his contributions as someone like Dr. King. Of course. Because Dr. King, of course, was a straight man, mm -hmm. and you just get more privilege. A reverend, a yeah. father, a husband. Yes, a family man. A and you can't family. be a family man and also be a gay man, right? Like, that's another stereotype. Oh, I've never seen one. No, no. never no. seen one. <laughs> gay men with kids? Absolutely yeah. none. So Married? No. Yeah. yeah. I so, don't think that... Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that is, you know, that's a really important story to tell. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think that a lot of what it touches on is mm -hmm. those stereotypes and like the juxtaposition between what it was like in any of those events during any mm -hmm. of those times for people who were both white and gay or black and straight mm -hmm. in comparison to people who were black and gay. Yeah, um, And I mean, even still, like it is a conversation that doesn't come up very often anymore you know it's not something and i what i mean by that is in my own white circles um it's not something that that comes up between myself and my white peers mm -hmm. often i of course cannot speak for who it does come up for but but i think that it is something that is still incredibly relevant even if neither being black nor being gay has quite as much social and societal pushback as it once did. People, and I, this <laughs> this is going to sound so, but like people like Lil Nas X, right? Mm -hmm. Like he genuinely is doing so much for both sides of his own community right oh, now. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Because it still is absolutely just this taboo to be, a black gay man, especially like in the music industry and like in the rap industry, like you're not allowed to be both of those things at the same time. This mm -hmm. is 2022. This book that we're talking about focuses on the timeline of 1950 to 1990. And here we are 30 and years here after we that. we are in 2022. Mm -hmm. And it still prohibits you from being successful, being accepted, you don't get to be influential mm -hmm. in media and black and gay and a man. Especially because that highlights, uh, like that's what the whole discussion of Juneteenth and Pride Month are kind of about, is think about that in rap and hip-hop music, a lot of what's often on display is that machismo, that toughness. I'm the biggest, I'm the baddest. Mm -hmm. You know, if you if you come, if you step up to me, you're going to have the worst time. Yeah. And so a lot of rap music incorporates bragging, right? Yes. That's what it's, a lot of it's based on, is talking about how cool you are or dissing someone else and, and like belittling them. And so if you show any weakness... It makes you a target for other people to come in and very easily tear you down because then, you know, if you if you open a crack in that armor, someone's going to release a diss track on you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, and Lil Nas X pulled a Game of Thrones and was like, nah, wear it. And then they can't use it against you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so folks like him. Yeah. Kicking open some doors really, really wide. Uh, Frank Ocean the same way. Yeah, absolutely. Years before Frank Ocean. Um, and there are even, I think we're seeing a, a tonal shift because we see other artists who maybe are not entirely part of that community or I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't know for sure. Um, I don't think I've ever heard Lizzo talk about being LGBT, but she sure, she is here. She is, she is She's an ally. Loud. She is <laughs> an ally. She has a whole song that is like, listen. <laughs> yeah. And then I feel listen. like in the same vein, and, like, um, He's not black or gay, but like the amount of work that Jack Harlow is doing with Lil Nas X, yeah, right? Mm -hmm. And like true. how loudly he speaks up 
for yes. him. And who he is and where he's from. Like, yes. That yeah. is just an amazing... It is. It's yeah. absolutely incredible. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Thank Jack Harlow. Yeah. Jack Harlow, Harlow yeah. if you're listening to our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but I, I think it really is... Mm-hmm. Im- it, it, of course, it's important for people to be these incredibly strong allies, not only of one community, but of both right. communities, especially when they are speaking on behalf of someone who is part of both communities. Yeah. Promoting other people, uplifting the voices that need to be raised and need to be heard over your own is very important. And that's how you do it. And that's what, I mean, if you are a straight white person who is in any way influential in media and society, like whatever, I'm sorry, I don't care if you think it is or not. That's your responsibility. Yeah, because one of the things we have to be careful of, uh, a thing that's like we get into our heads very easily, is we pat ourselves on the back too much, right? Mm -hmm. We make ourselves the hero. Oh, I Um, shared a post about this. So like, I did a good thing. Right. And it's kind of like, no, you have to, you have to care about and and protect and and uplift black voices and black folks all year around, not just on June 19th. Mm -hmm. You have to be there for the queer community all year round, not just from June 1st to June 30th, like a lot of corporations are with their branding. You know, there's that's a meme. It's become a meme. It's like June 12.01 a.m. June 1st. uh Here come the rainbow colored, you know, (laughs) Oreos or Lego bricks or whatever it is. And then at 11.59 June 30th, it all like someone flips a switch. Right. Uh, So we can't give ourselves a gold star for doing the bare minimum. No, because when you step back and think about it, just just <laughs> turn all of that off. Just don't use any specific terminology. Just think of if someone is in need, if someone's having a harder time than you, the average person generally feels some level of compulsion, I think, to step in and give someone else a hand. Right. If someone collapses on your doorstep from heat stroke, you you don't like you don't open the door and be like, oh, excuse me, brah, hey, listen. Could you not? Could you please do this somewhere else? <laughs> You're inconveniencing. You're inconveniencing me. me. It's That's like true. no, you get them a glass of water, right? You probably you call nine one one. Same thing for any of this other stuff, right? If someone is being bullied, if someone is being hurt, you step in. If you feel safe to do so, in whatever way that you're able to. You leverage the fact that you're not being bullied to help someone else be bullied less. And that is just the bare minimum human experience, I think. And we're seeing, like I said, a tonal shift where for a lot of folks, a lot of celebrities are using their platforms to do that. And I think that to kind of bring it back around, that's what Juneteenth gives us an opportunity to do. It gives us an opportunity. It, It puts a day on the calendar where you have to confront this thing that happened that is often pushed to the background. Because it makes you what? Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. (laughs) There you go. And it means that one day a year you are reminded, when previously on exactly zero days per year you were officially reminded, Mm -hmm. now at least once a year you're going to be reminded, hey, think about the uncomfortable thing. Maybe do something about it, right? Maybe look at it and do a thing. And even if the thing that you do about it is to come here or log on to the, the app, log on to the Libby app, go to our website at rowancountylibrary.org and check out our displays and maybe read some of these books, listen to some of these audiobooks, watch a documentary or check out a series, right, that talks about these issues, that's okay if that's what you're doing. But this is your reminder to do something, And there is no place that makes it easier to do something than here at the library. We've got something for you to do that. However you want to contribute, whether that is self-growth and education, learning about it, whether that is exposing yourself to new content creators, new media, pushing the boundaries, getting outside of your box and your comfort zone, we've got something. We can help point you in the right direction, and we are so, so glad to do so. Atlanta has always got good book recommendations. Emery knows where everything is on the shelf, and if you need something online on the app, let me know. I will get it for you. 24 to 48 hours, you will have that book. So don't hesitate to use us as the resource that we are, because we are a resource for Pride Month. We're a resource for Juneteenth. We're a resource all year long. The library does not shut on and off on any particular day of the year, except for those holidays. Like Juneteenth, when Where we will be closed. you can still access, access our digital catalog. <laughs> there you go. There you go. See? God. So our resources never shut off. Yeah. Really. It never shuts off. Even if we're closed on June 20th for Juneteenth, 
the resources are still there. So let us know what you need and we will provide it. That's what we do. We are here for the community. We belong to you. And we will be back next month with more information about what's coming up as everybody heads back to school in August. I can't believe summer is almost over. But hey, there's still time if you're listening to this to register for summer reading. The last day is July 1st, so you have time. Come register for that before you have to get back to school. And they start making you read stuff that you don't want to. If you don't register, you can't win the kayaks. We've had so many people ask about those kayaks. Why are there boats in the library? (laughs) Oh, the kayaks? You haven't heard about the kayaks? You haven't heard about the kayaks? We have kayaks. Come see the kayaks. Yeah, I think we can talk about that now. Yeah, you have to register for summer reading. And if you come to a certain number of programs and read a certain number of books, you can win a whole boat. So, like, really, why not? Boat. I think that I say, why not just do it every time that we talk about <laughs> summer reading? But, like, what? But, but why, why not? not just do it? Yeah. Just do it. Just, just write do it. down what you're doing. It's just about writing down what you're reading. We don't have any actual requirements, unless you want the kayak. Then <laughs> then you got to come here a few times. But, like, but you're why probably do you not coming want to? here anyway if you're, like, checking out books from us, right? So Yeah, and true. also think of all the fun things. The Tada party went so well. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know that, like, tomorrow, as of this recording, Jess is doing ocean the, the tiny jar. ocean in yes. a jar. That is so cute. Yeah. I can't wait. We have the chalk art contest coming up. We have the clay undersea sculptures. We have the tiny art night. The upcycled plastic waste into jewelry. So why all, not? Why not? <laughs> why not? Come here and learn, whether it is about Pride Month, whether it's about Juneteenth and American history in general, whether it's... It's about black superheroes, real life folks like Harriet Tubman and the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. or whatever your desire. Come here and we'll give you a hand. I'm Morgan. I'm Emery. And I'm Atlanta. And thank you for listening to The Reading Room, the podcast brought to you by your Rowan County Public Library.